This morning I'd like to speak on the topic of rebaptism. Uh, I should have really done this a long time ago. I don't I, I've talked about it, but I've never covered it extensively in a sermon. And every time that I have an opportunity to baptize somebody again, several times, probably at least half the time, they have already been baptized in some church or another. And then the, the question comes up, well, why do I need to be baptized again? And uh, so that's what I want to talk about today and kind of give a, a, a thorough explanation for this. Not everything that is called a baptism is one, right? Just because something's called that doesn't mean it is so. Not everything that's called a church is a church. Not everything that's called a Bible is a Bible. Not every being that people call Jesus is Jesus, right? There's another Jesus and there's false Christ and so on. So there's lots of false Bibles out there. There's lots of false versions of Christianity. And there's lots of false versions of baptism out there also. And if a baptism does not meet the scriptural requirements for a valid baptism, then it's invalid. And this is what everything we believe comes down to. What saith the scripture? Does it meet the scriptural requirements? And I'll give those requirements later. But not every act involving two people and water is a baptism. Right? Just because two people in water are involved doesn't mean it's a baptism. And I'll give you some examples here. For instance, the following acts here would not be a valid baptism. First of all, your friend pushes you into a swimming pool. Is that a baptism? Well, it did involve an administrator putting you into the water. You were immersed, right? Is that a baptism? No, it's not, is it? Or your son squirts you with a squirt gun. You had an administrator. You had a candidate. You had water, maybe hit you on the forehead. You had water being sprinkled on your forehead. Is that a baptism? Your mother gives you a bath when you're one month old. Is that a baptism? I knew a guy, his wife, quote, baptized him in the bathtub um, after he was an internet preacher for a long time and realized he needed to be baptized. And he thought that counted. Or how about this one? We're getting closer and closer to what more people would consider baptism. A guy with a funny-looking collar pours or sprinkles water on your head shortly after you're born in a building with stained glass windows. Is that a baptism? It's not a baptism, no more than your son squirting you with a squirt gun. How about a pastor of a Protestant church which was founded hundreds of years ago by a disgruntled Catholic priest who wanted to form his own state church, performed a Catholic baptism on you, by a different name, of course, by pouring and sprinkling water on your head. Is that a baptism? It's not a baptism, is it? And I will explain why. Or how about this one? A guy in skinny jeans and an untucked shirt who went to seminary and became a leader of a church who some other guy with a bright idea started dunks you in a tub of water. Is that a baptism? No. Skinny jeans notwithstanding, that is not a baptism. So in this sermon, I'm going to give you the scriptural reasons why none of those things are valid baptisms. Because there are actually scriptural reasons why those things aren't baptisms. Some of them are completely obvious, but I could actually prove to you with the Bible why each and every one of those is not a valid baptism, because they don't meet the scriptural criteria. Now, Baptist churches have a long history of rebaptizing converts who had previously been baptized invalidly in other churches. This is not anything that is unique to our church. Baptist churches, and I use the Baptist with a small b, Baptistic churches, have been doing this since, well, probably since the founding of the Catholic Church anyway, since there were false churches out there that were giving false baptisms. Baptist churches have been rebaptizing people forever, and there's lots of them that still do. Actually, I would think all of them do. If, if, a, if a Baptist church isn't rebaptizing people that were baptized as infants or sprinkling or pouring, then they're not a church either if they're allowing people with those kind of baptisms into their membership. Now, the term rebaptism is technically not a correct term because if a baptism was performed correctly, or incorrectly, pardon me, it is no baptism at all. So if you didn't have a, a real bona fide baptism, it actually wasn't a baptism, even if it looked like one. And so technically, you guys are getting baptized this morning. You're not getting rebaptized because your previous baptisms like some of the rest of us, a lot of us, I'm sure Karen was baptized before. I was baptized a couple times. Bev was baptized twice, uh, so-called. Uh, so a lot of us, Christina, were you baptized before? She was too. So uh, a lot of us have been uh, so-called baptized prior to getting it done the right way. Some of us two or three times. 
And if I would have kept looking, it would have probably been more than two. I would have just, if I wouldn't have found the, the, if the Lord wouldn't have brought me to the real church, who knows how many times I might have been baptized before getting it right. So therefore, when a convert gets rebaptized, he is in actuality getting baptized for the first time. Now, many true Baptistic churches went by the name of Anabaptist for hundreds of years. You may have heard this term. How many of you heard, or a show of hands, you heard the term Anabaptist? Many churches went by this term for a long time, for hundreds of years, because they rebaptized converts that came to them from the Roman Catholic Church and other false churches. Now, I think a lot of people think that the Anabaptists came about during the time of the Reformation. And nowadays, Anabaptists are, are pretty messed up, I think, as far as their, their doctrine goes. I don't even know if, if some Anabaptists even baptize by immersion anymore. And um, I, I, I think that they've, they've gone out of the way, the, the group that bears that official name anyway. But historically, these people existed for hundreds and hundreds of years, long before the Protestant Reformation. And I'll give you some quotes that will prove that here in just a second. Now, an Anabaptist is one who baptizes over again. This is definition from the Oxford English Dictionary. Whether frequently as a point of ritual or once as, as a due performance of what has been ineffectually performed previously. So in other words, there are some Anabaptists, I guess, that would, maybe the whole congregation would get rebaptized every so often just as a ritual, which what, what the point of that is, I don't know. Uh, but then there are other Anabaptists, and, and what people really mean by Anabaptist are those who do a baptism over again because it was ineffectually done the first time. So we would be an Anabaptist church by definition. Not, not the denomination, not the official title, but by definition of the word, we are an Anabaptist church. Like I said, there were Christians who were called Anabaptists throughout time, going back to the, at least the third century because they rebaptized converts who had been baptized as infants. Basically, there have been Anabaptists, like I said, as long as the Catholic Church has been around. Let me give you some quotes here. This is, these are some quotes from some uh, books on Baptist church history that I read several years ago in preparation for the sermon series that I did called Baptist Church History. And you can check that out if you just go to PastorWagner.com and go to the All Doctrinal Topics tab. Um, you can click on Baptist Church History. I even have a nice uh, spreadsheet there showing all the groups throughout the different centuries coming right down to the present day. I've got a map showing where all they were located in Northern Africa and in the Mediterranean and in Europe and England and um, so on. So there's a lot of information there. And uh, it's all quoted from, from uh, scholarly books. But here's a quote from Orchard. He was a, a church historian, a Baptist church historian. It's called A Concise History of Foreign Baptists. This is page 87. He says, Osiander says, this is another church historian, Osiander says, our modern Anabaptists were the same with the Donatists of old. Now, the Donatists were another Christian group that were around from the 300s AD to the 900s AD in northern Africa. I covered them in that series. They were Baptistic churches back then, and they were in opposition to the Roman Catholic Church and its system, and they were persecuted by them. Here's a quote from W.A. Jarrell in his church, in his book, Baptist Church History, page 303. He says, in 1522, Luther says, this is Martin Luther, the, the reformer, the founder of the Lutheran Church. In 1522, Luther says, quote, the Anabaptists have been for a long time spreading in Germany. For a long time. In 1522 was the very beginning of the Reformation. I think it was 1525 when he nailed the thesis the 95 Thesis to the church in Wittenberg, I think. I don't remember. Anyway, it was in the 1520s, I'm pretty sure. So this is right in the very beginning of the Reformation. He says the Anabaptists have been spreading in Germany for a long time. And he was friendly with the Anabaptists before he started the Lutheran Church and started to persecute them. Gerald goes on to say, The late E.T. Winkler, D.D., Doctrine of Divinity, Quoting the above says, quote, Nay, Luther even traced the Anabaptists back to the days of John Huss. John Huss lived from 1369 to 1415 and apologetically admits that the eminent reformer was one of them. So John Huss, the, one of the famous reformers way back in the 13 and 1400s, was an Anabaptist. They didn't come about in the Protestant Reformation. Here's a quote, another quote from Gerald. 
He says, Dr. E.T. Winkler says, quote, it is well known that the Anabaptist of Holland disclaimed any historic connection with the fanatical Anabaptist of Germany, but claimed a descent from the Walden Seas. See, they didn't come from, there the, were the, these German Anabaptists, which were essentially part of the Reformation, I think. Um, and anyway, whether they were or not, I'm not positive on that. But the point is, these Anabaptists here in Holland didn't claim to come from the ones in Germany. They came from the Walden Seas. The Walden Seas were a Baptistic Christian group from southern France and northern Italy in the Alps. They were around from the 1100s, the early 1100s, to the 1600s. The Protestant Reformation started in the 1500s. So these people were around for hundreds of years prior to the Protestant Reformation. You probably heard of the Catholic Inquisition, right? Where the Catholics went out and they murdered millions and millions of Christians. This, the standard historical narrative is there was the Catholic Church from 300 AD, the Catholics would say from 33 AD, but from 325 AD until 1500, you had the Catholic Church, and that was Christianity. That was all the Christianity there was, and then you had the Protestant Reformation, and then you got a bunch of versions of Christianity. The Inquisition happened prior to the Protestant Reformation. Who were the millions of Christians the Catholics were killing if there were only Catholics? Right? They were killing the Baptists. They were, this is before the Protestant Reformation. Here's another quote from Gerald. Dr. Osgood says of the Anabaptists of the 16th century, the per, quote, the persecution of centuries had taught them concealment, unquote, plainly implying their existence centuries before the days of Luther. I mean, this is an incontrover incontrovertible fact that the Anabaptists were around hundreds of years prior to the Reformation. Here's another one. This is my favorite one. This is from Gerald. He's quoting a guy named Cardinal Hosius. Cardinal Hosius... I think that's how you pronounce his name. President of the Council of Trent. That's a famous Catholic council. You've probably heard of it. President of the Council of Trent, which met, which met uh, December 15th, 1545. So this is right in the thick of the Protestant Reformation. Catholics are meeting to try to figure out how they're going to stop it. And one of the most learned Romanists, another name for a Catholic, one of the most learned Romanists of his day said, quote, this is Car Cardinal Hosius saying this, quote, if the truth of religion were to be judged of by the readiness and cheerfulness of which a man of any sect shows in suffering, then the opinion and persuasion of no sect can be truer and surer than that of the Anabaptists. Since, they have been, since there have been none for these 1,200 years past, that have been more generally punished and that have been more and that have more steadfastly undergone and even offered themselves to the most cruel sorts of punishment than these people. The Anabaptists are a pernicious sect of which kind the Waldensian brethren seem to have been. Nor is this heresy a modern thing for it existed in the time of Austin. That is Augustine, or Augustine is how you really pronounce his name. Most people say Augustine, the famous Catholic back in the 4th century. Thus, this Romanish scholar concedes the sameness of the Waldenses and Anabaptists and that they, had, that they already existed in 354, the time of Austin. So here is a prominent Catholic, a cardinal. And the cardinals are like right below the Pope, right? So here is a Catholic cardinal saying that the Anabaptists have been around and been persecuted for 1,200 years past. He's writing this, saying this in 1545. That takes us the whole way back to the 4th century, to 345 AD, right at basically the founding of the Catholic Church. That's who was persecuting them all that time. So out of the out of the Catholics' mouths. Now, of course, he calls them heretics. When you look back through these Baptist groups, um, the, the Catholics in, in the literature always call them heretics, right? Because that, that, to them, they were heretics. Here's another quote. This is from Dr. Phil Stringer in his book, The Faithful Baptist Witness, page 115. He says, the, the Quaker, Robert Barclay, wrote, quote, we shall, always, we shall afterwards show the rise of the Anabaptists we shall afterwards show the rise of the Anabaptists took place prior to the reformation of the Church of England. 
and there also and there are also reasons for believing that on the continent of Europe small hidden Christian societies who have held many of the opinions of the Anabaptists have existed from the time of the the times of the apostles in the sense of the direct transmission of divine truth and the true nature of spiritual religion it seems probable that these churches have a lineage or succession more ancient than that of the church of the Roman church. So they existed in parallel, the Anabaptists and, and many other groups, and I will list off some of them here for you in a minute. But the Anabaptists, the Waldenses, the Paterines, the Albigenses, the Montanists, the Donatists, the Novatians, the Paulicians, the, there's a lot of these groups went by different names. They existed in parallel to the Catholic church all that time in an unbroken lineage. So historic Baptists are Anabaptists. Eventually the name Anna was just dropped and they were called Baptists. Here's a quote from Orchard again. He says, Fuller, the English church historian, asserts that the Baptists in England in his days were the Donatists new dipped. And Robinson declares they were Trinitarian Anabaptists. So English Baptists were Donatists new dipped. Like I said, Donatists go the whole way back to the 300s, 300s to the 900s in Northern Africa. They were Trinitarian Anabaptists, he says. So, Baptists are Anabaptists. And the Apostle Paul himself was an Anabaptist by definition because he rebaptized converts who had not been properly baptized the first time. Let me just read that to you again. I did it at the, at the call to worship this morning. But in Acts 19, 1 through 5, I'm just going to show you here is a biblical precedent for rebaptizing somebody who had not been properly baptized in the first place. Acts 19 and verse 1, And it came to pass, while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus, and finding certain disciples, he said unto them, Have ye received the Holy Ghost since ye believed? And they said unto him, We have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. They obviously lacked some teaching when they got baptized. They didn't even know there was a Holy Ghost. Jesus said, Go ye into all the world, teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. They didn't even know if there was a Holy Ghost. Well, obviously somebody didn't baptize them right, did they? And he said unto them, Unto what then were ye baptized? They said, Unto John's baptism. Well, John saw the Spirit of God descending, the Holy Ghost descending and landing on, uh, landing on Christ as a dove, right? John knew about the Holy Ghost. Jesus, John said that Jesus had the Spirit of God, uh, didn't have the Spirit of God with, uh, with measure. or with, I forget how he said it, but he received not the Spirit uh, in measure, something like that. So anyway, John knew, knew full well about the Holy Ghost. So these guys had some kind of a corrupted baptism from some guy probably claiming to have John's baptism. Then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. So they had a baptism that they thought was a real baptism, and apparently it looked like a real baptism, but they were missing key and critical and crucial information, and therefore their baptism was not valid. So let's just take a step back. What is baptism? Let's just define the term here. Baptism is the action or ceremony of baptizing, immersion of a person in water, or application of water by pouring or sprinkling as a religious rite ceremony of moral or spiritual purification or regeneration and as a Christian ordinance betokening initiation into the church. Now you just have to take out that little part there about pouring and sprinkling because what the OED is defining is baptism as it is practiced in the world today and there's a lot of people out there that pour and sprinkle that call it baptism so therefore they're, they're putting that in there. But baptism is not by pouring and sprinkling, and I will prove that irrefutably in this study. Now, the definition of the word baptize, if we go back to the etymology of the word, that means the history of where the word came from. And you see, if you look in the Oxford English Dictionary, in the etymology, in the beginning, you'll see that it comes from the Greek word baptizo and a Latin word, which is similar to that. And those words in Greek and Latin, which is where the English word comes from, mean to immerse, bathe, wash, drench, in Christian use appropriated to the religious rite, to dip, plunge, bathe. So that's what those words meant in the 
Greek and in the Latin. Okay, so to take a word that literally means to immerse and then to transliterate it to, into English and say it means to sprinkle or to pour is ridiculous. Right? That, that's a contradiction of terms. To baptize means to immerse in water, and there you have it, or pour or sprinkle water upon as a means of ceremonial purification or in token of initiation into a religious society, especially into the Christian church, to christen. So baptism is a figure. It is figurative. See, I've had people argue with me um, saying that it really doesn't matter how you baptize because baptism is just figurative. So you just you know, sprinkling, pouring, immersing, whatever. It's just figurative. What does it figure? If it's figurative, it must figure something. What does it figure? Think about that. It's figurative of our salvation by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. First uh, Peter 3 and verse 21. First Peter 3 and verse 21. Uh, that's the wrong book. First Peter 3 and verse 21. It says, The like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. If you take out the parenthetical clause, it would say the like figure whereunto baptism doth also now save us by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's a figure. It's a figure of the resurrection of Christ. It's a figure of how Christ saved us by his death, burial, and resurrection. Baptism figures. How Jesus saved us, like I said, by his death, burial, and resurrection. Romans 6 is very plain. Romans 6, 3 through 5 shows us here what exactly baptism is a figure of. Romans 6, 3 through 5. Know ye not that so many of us, as were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness pardon me, of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Baptism is likened unto a burial, right? And doesn't it figure a burial? Well, you put the person down inside under the water. They're completely buried in water, right? And then they are raised up out of the water to walk in newness of life, right? So they have died. They've gone under the water. They've been raised up out of the water, to walk in newness of life. Just like Christ died, he was buried in the heart of the earth, he was raised up again and he came out of the earth. Baptism is a great figure of that. How is it a figure if you take somebody and pour water on their forehead? How does that symbol death, burial, and resurrection? It doesn't. Now, baptism does not remove sin. Peter said, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh. And rather than giving a man a good conscience... Baptism is the answer of a good conscience. See, baptism can't change your nature and give you a good conscience. You take a sinner that has a, a wicked, defiled conscience, or no conscience at all, he is not going to be changed by putting him under the water and bringing him up out of the water. He's going to go into that water the same man as he comes out of that water. His conscience won't be changed. Baptism doesn't give you a good conscience. It doesn't save you eternally. It is the answer of a good conscience. It's the response of the good conscience that God has already put within one of his children. So one already has to have a good, a good conscience to be baptized. And we read about people with a defiled conscience there in Titus 1 and verse 15, just to show you that all men don't have a good conscience. There are some people out there that don't have the pricks of conscience. When you do something wrong and you feel guilty about it and you feel, you feel badly about it or when you're thinking about doing something wrong and something inside you says, don't do that. There's a lot of people out there that don't have that. The only conscience they may have is, oh, you may get caught. You better be careful. You better wait. Don't do it during daylight. You know, make sure you do it when you don't get caught. Titus 1 and verse 15, Unto the pure all things are pure, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure. 
but even their mind and their conscience is defiled. So you have to have a person with a changed conscience to be able to answer from that good conscience to request and desire to be baptized. And baptism is also a commandment for every believer in Jesus Christ. And to not do so is to reject the counsel of God against oneself. Look at Acts 2, 37 through 38. Baptism is not a take it or leave it proposition. The church that I grew up in, that's pretty much what it was. It was never preached. I don't ever remember hearing a sermon on it. Nobody was ever encouraged to get baptized. If somebody did, that was great and fine and dandy, but it was never preached. It was just, oh, you know, you could be a member of the church without being baptized. It just wasn't necessary. I know founding members of the church that I was, that I grew up in, founding members, at least one, I think two, that I, can, I know for one for absolute certain, that were never baptized. Spr- had their foreheads sprinkled as a Lutheran, as a baby, never baptized. Founding members of the church. They just didn't care about it. Well, God cares about it. I care about it. Acts 2, 37 through 38. Now when they heard this, this, these are the Jews on the day of Pentecost hearing Peter's preaching. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their hearts and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? That's a biblical altar call right there. When somebody hears the preaching of the word and they're convicted in their hearts by what they hear, they come up to the preacher and they say, what should I do? You see, the world has it backwards. The preacher stands up there and calls them to come. Tells them what to do. Come on down to the altar, sinner. Get yourself saved. These sinners here were pricked and they came to the preacher and said, what do I do? That's a a proper altar call, if you will. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. What shall we do? Repent and be baptized, he said. Now, a person that will not do that, that hears the gospel, knows that they ought to be baptized, and just doesn't want to for whatever reason, they are rejecting the counsel of God against themselves. Luke 7, 29 through 30. Luke 7, 29 through 30. It's not a take it or leave it proposition. Luke seven twenty nine and all the people that heard him, that heard the Lord Jesus Christ, and the publicans justified God being baptized with the baptism of John, but the Pharisees and lawyers rejected the counsel of God against themselves, being not baptized of him. They rejected God's counsel. God tells them, get baptized. They say, nope, not doing it. Now, I don't know about you, but I would not want to be in a position where God tells me to flat out do something, I say, nope, I'm not doing it. What happens when your parents, when you're little and your parents tell you to do something, you say, nope, I'm not doing it. Braden knows what happens, right? When your dad says do something, you say, nope, I'm not doing it. What happens? Your butt hurts, right? That's right. That's what happens to God's children too. God says do something, they don't do it, their butt hurts. God's got all kinds of ways to give spankings. So, what constitutes a valid baptism? For a baptism to be scriptural, it must have five, must meet five criteria. A proper administrator, a proper candidate, a proper mode, a proper belief, and a proper result. Now that sounds all complicated, doesn't even sound biblical, but I'll, I'll explain what I mean by those words and you'll see that this is... This is biblical. The terms aren't necessarily in the Bible, but you'll, you'll see that this is certainly biblical. So a proper administrator. The proper administrator is the baptizer, right? The, the guy that does the baptism. The pastor, in other words. The proper administrator for baptism is a validly ordained minister. If you go to Matthew 28, 16 through 20, we'll read Jesus parting words as he leaves this earth and he gave this commission to his disciples which were his apostles that they were to preach the gospel and baptize Matthew 28 16 through 20 then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them 
And when they saw him, they worshipped, but some doubted. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Now these disciples were not just any old disciples, right? These are not just you know, some of the 5,000 people that were following Christ to get the loaves and fishes. These are the 11 disciples. In other words, these were his 11 apostles. These are his ordained ministers. And he tells them, the ordained ministers, to go and teach all nations and baptize them in the name of the Trinity. Now, the only people in the Bible that baptized were ordained ministers, apostles, prophets, evangelists, etc., And I'm not going to prove this because I don't have time, but if you go back to the Basic Bible Doctrine series from eight years ago, I did two parts on baptism there. You can find them. If you just go to pastorwagner.com slash baptism, you'll see they're listed there, baptism parts one and two. And in that sermon, I went into more detail, and I showed you every single instance of a baptism in the New Testament. Every single time anybody was baptized, and we saw every single time somebody was baptized, it was by an ordained minister. Never was it just by some guy just deciding he was going to baptize somebody. Now, preachers or pastors or elders or bishops, these are all terms for the same office, they are authorized to baptize. And I can prove this to you. I've got to compare a couple of scriptures, but I'll show you. Uh, Turn with me to Titus 1 and verse 5. We're going to see, first of all, that pastors are ordained ministers. Titus 1 and verse 5. Paul says to Titus, For this cause left I thee in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting, and ordain elders in every city as I had appointed thee. There you see to ordain and to appoint are the same thing. Ordain elders as I had appointed thee. Right, so it's the same thing. Paul had ordained Titus, and he tells Titus to go ordain others. I'll get to that later. All I wanted from that was that Titus was a pastor, was an elder, was an ordained minister. Now, pastors and elders are to do the work of an evangelist. Go back one page to 2 Timothy 4 and verse 5. He tells Timothy, this is another one of his ordained ministers that he had ordained. 2 Timothy 4 and verse 5, But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. Okay, so do the work of an evangelist. Well, what is the work of an evangelist? What does an evangelist do? Well, evangelists preach the gospel and baptize. I'll prove this to you from Acts uh, 21 and verse 8. Just keep all these things in your head and it will become crystal clear here in just a second. Acts 21 and verse 8. It says, And the next day we that were of Paul's company departed and came unto Caesarea, and we entered into the house of Philip the Evangelist, which was one of the seven, and abode with him. Philip the Evangelist. He's the only man that is called an evangelist by name that I'm aware of in the Bible. He was also a deacon, but these are two separate offices. He's one of the seven. He was one of the deacons that was ordained in Acts chapter 6. But this is a totally different office. Evangelist and deacon are not the same office. Now, I want to show you that evangelists baptize. So go back to Acts chapter 8, verses 36 through 38. Acts chapter 8, 36 through 38. And, when, and as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water. This is Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still. And they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. That's Philip the evangelist. Now, I'm just going to briefly mention it. It's not Philip the apostle. Philip was also, one of the, one of the apostles was also named Philip. But this is not Philip the apostle. It's Philip the evangelist. You say, how do I know that? Or maybe you don't say that. Maybe you're like, who cares? But I'm going to tell you anyway, because it matters to me, believe me. In Acts chapter 8, in the beginning of the chapter, there's a great persecution of the church in Jerusalem, and it says that they were all scattered, verse 1, abroad throughout all the regions of Judea and Samaria, except 
the apostles. The apostles stayed in Jerusalem. All the rest of the disciples were dispersed. And among the dispersed was Philip, verse 5, who went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ. And then he went on and he preached different places. Philip went down into Samaria. Not Philip the Apostle. Philip the Apostle was in Jerusalem. It's Philip the Evangelist. Okay? So, my whole point here is that Philip was an evangelist and Philip baptized. And Paul told Timothy to do the work of an evangelist. And what does an evangelist do? Preaches the gospel and baptizes. Therefore, what does a pastor do? What is one of the pastor's duties? To preach the gospel and baptize. Okay? So, I said all that just to show you that I am authorized by Jesus Christ to baptize. Now, there is no commandment nor example in Scripture of anyone besides ordained ministers baptizing. I proved that in those baptism sermons that, I'm, um, that I referenced to you a minute ago. I'm not going to do that again. But you'd have to find one for me to disprove me. I look through the entire New Testament. I find no commandment or example in Scripture of anybody besides ordained ministers baptizing. So, therefore, no one besides an ordained minister can baptize. And we would employ the argument from silence here. I'm not going to read it in the interest of time, but in Hebrews 7, 12 through 14, we've been through that verse before. That's the argument from silence. God had told Moses that the sons of Levi would be the priests. God spake nothing about the tribe of Judah being the priests. So therefore, when God said the Levites are the priests, that automatically means that the tribe of Judah is not the priest or any other tribe. That means just the Levites. So when God says somebody's to do something, that automatically excludes everybody else. It's the argument from silence. So when God says and gives examples of ordained ministers baptizing, that means that nobody else is authorized to do so. Now the question is, who is a validly ordained minister? Because there's a lot of pastors out there, so-called, a lot of ministers out there, claiming to be validly ordained ministers. Catholic priests think that. Lutheran pastors think that. Right? Presbyterian ministers think that. Community church pastors who went to some college somewhere think that. Right? There's a lot of people out there that think that they're ministers of God. But who does the Bible say is an ordained, validly ordained minister? The office of the pastor or the elder or the bishop, the overseer, is conferred by ordination or appointment by one ordained minister to another faithful man. That's how it happens. We're going to do a little bit of reasoning here. We're going to start with Jesus Christ. He was the first one that was ordained or appointed by God to be a minister. Hebrews 3 and verse 2. Hebrews 3 and verse 2. This may be a little bit tedious. I don't think it's tedious, but some people might think it's tedious. But this is absolutely crucial to finding out who is authorized to baptize. Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 2. It says, Who is faithful to him, talking about Christ Jesus, who is faithful to him that appointed him, as also Moses was faithful in all his house. Jesus Christ was faithful to God the Father who appointed him. Jesus was appointed by God to be a minister. And Jesus is called a minister in another place in the scripture. He's also called a pastor because he's called a shepherd, the great shepherd of the sheep, the shepherd and bishop of our souls. A shepherd is a pastor. A bishop is the same office as a pastor. Jesus was a pastor. He started a church. He had a flock. What is a pastor? It's a keeper of sheep, right? He said, fear not, little flock. And he said, my sheep hear my voice. Jesus was a pastor. And Jesus was appointed or ordained by God to be a pastor. And then Jesus ordained Paul to be a pastor and an apostle and a preacher. 1 Timothy 2 and verse 7. 1 Timothy 2 and verse 7. Paul says, Whereunto I am ordained a preacher and an apostle, I speak the truth in Christ and lie not, and a, t a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and verity. A pastor is a teacher. He gave some pastors and teachers, we're told in Ephesians chapter 4. Paul was Paul hold, held a bunch of offices. He was an apostle. He was a prophet. He was a preacher. He was a pastor. He was a teacher. Right? He, he held all the offices. So, God the Father ordained Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ ordained Paul. Paul then ordains Timothy and Titus. 
Turn with me to 1 Timothy 4 and verse 14. He says, neglect not. He's writing to Timothy, this young preacher. Neglect not the gift that is in thee, which was given thee by prophecy, with the laying on of the hands of the presbytery. That was the gift of the ministry, which was given by ordination. It was given by the laying on of the hands of the presbytery. In this case, Paul was the presbytery. Because he says in 2 Timothy 1 and verse 6, he says, Wherefore, 2 Timothy 1, 6, Wherefore I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. See, Paul was the presbytery. Or at least he was part of the presbytery, one of the two. But Paul was one of the, either the only or one of the ordaining men that ordained Timothy to the ministry. He did the same thing for Titus. We already read that verse. He says, go and ordain others as I had uh, appointed thee. Then Timothy and Titus were then to ordain others. That's what he told Titus. You remember Titus 1.5, which I just read there. He said to uh, set in order the things that are wanting and ordain elders in every city as I had appointed thee. And then he tells Timothy in 2 Timothy 2 and verse 2. He says, And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. He's committing it to faithful men who can teach. He's committing it to men who are teachers who are going to teach others. Right? This is the propagation of the ministry. He had heard these things and had these things committed to him by Paul when he was ordained, and now he commits them to other faithful men who can teach others also. So, do you see the, the order here? This is, you know, way back in the, in the first century. Here we already have like five generations. We have God the Father ordaining Jesus Christ. Then Jesus ordains Paul. <clears throat> Paul ordains Timothy. Timothy is to ordain others who will be able to do likewise. Right? That's the propagation of the ministry. It's one ordained minister who ordains another man, and then that man goes out and trains and ordains another man, and so on. And that's how you get down to this good day. So therefore, to be a validly ordained pastor, one, uh, uh, to be a validly ordained pastor, who has the authority from Jesus Christ to baptize? A man must have been ordained by a pastor of a true church, who was ordained by a pastor of a true church, etc., in an unbroken lineage all the way back to the apostles. If you don't have that, you're not an ordained minister. If you just decided one day, I just think I'm a minister. I'm going to be a minister. I'm going to start calling myself pastor so-and-so. I'm just going to go out there and baptize some people and start a church. You can't do that. You're not an ordained minister. You have to have been ordained by a man that was ordained. And he had to have been ordained by a man that was ordained. And you got to go the whole way back or else somewhere that line breaks and somebody just decided they were going to be a pastor and had no right or authority from God to do so. So any man who is ordained in any church that traces its founding back to the Protestant Reformation is not a validly ordained pastor because his ordination came from the Catholic Church which is a false church with false priests who have no authority to baptize or ordain ministers. If you can trace your church history back to the Protestant Reformation, therefore you trace your church history back to the Catholic Church because the Protestant Reformation were Catholics that wanted to reform the Catholic Church. Martin Luther, John Calvin, Zwingli, Knox, those guys, they were all Catholics. So if you, if you trace your church back there, It's a Reformed Catholic Church, which is no church at all. And you can pretty much do it. You can take almost any denomination out there besides Historic Baptists and trace it back. Say you're a Methodist. Or maybe you're a part of a community church that broke away from the Methodist. You're a, you know, what, so-and-so community church. Where did you come from? The Methodist. Where did they come from? The Church of England. Where did the Church of England come from? The Protestant Reformation. King Henry, uh, King, uh, was it Henry? King Henry decided he wanted to have his own church. He wanted to be his own pope. He was a Catholic, but he wanted to get remarried. Right? So, right there, you trace your lineage back, Catholic church. You don't have a valid ordination. You don't have a valid baptism. So, anyone who was baptized by a minister in a Catholic, Orthodox, or Protestant church needs to be rebaptized because they weren't ever baptized properly by an ordained minister. 
anyone who is baptized by a minister in a church which was started by a Catholic or Protestant needs to be rebaptized. That was why I needed to be rebaptized. I was baptized by a guy that was a Protestant minister that started his own church. I'll get into that later. And anyone who was baptized by a man who is not ordained by a validly ordained Baptist pastor needs to be rebaptized. Now, in our case, as that church study on Baptist church history shows, we can trace our lineage right back to the days of the apostles. We came from the primitive Baptists. The primitive Baptists came from the Welsh Baptists who came over from England. From well, It wasn't really England. It was Wales, which is the southern part of the UK. They came over from Wales way back in the 17th century, I think it was, in the 1600s. And there had been Baptists in Wales from the first century. And we got the history to prove it. We didn't come out of the Protestant Reformation. Now, the second thing that's necessary to have a proper true baptism is a proper candidate. The proper candidate, and by candidate, I mean the person that is being baptized. The proper candidate for baptism is a penitent, believing adult. In order to be baptized, a person must show forth the fruits of repentance. Matthew 3, 5 through 8. When somebody comes to our church and they want to be baptized, we want to see the proof of a changed life, right? We just don't come in off the street and just make no changes and you're going to still drink way too much and you're living with your girlfriend and you're whatever, you know, that isn't going to happen. And we want to see proof of a changed life, of a reformed life. Matthew 3, 5 through 8. Then went unto out unto him. Then went out to him Jerusalem. Let me let me start again. Then went out to him Jerusalem, and all Judea, and all the region round about Jordan, and were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth therefore fruits meet for repentance. And don't think that being a Jew is going to be good enough. That's what he said. My paraphrase in the next verse. I don't care if you're children of Abraham. God can raise up of these stones, children of Abraham. you got to bring forth some fruit for repentance. These Pharisees, they weren't repenting of anything. They just wanted to get in to whatever this new movement was so that they could corrupt it, which is exactly what they ended up doing. John wasn't having it. Repentance was and is necessary for baptism in the New Testament church. You remember what Peter said on the day of Pentecost. They asked, what should we do? He said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. So this prevents babies from being baptized because they can't repent. When is the last time you saw a two-week-old baby feel sorry about what he just did? I'm really sorry I just soiled that diaper, Mom. I'm going to try not to do that again. When's the last time you saw a six-month-old baby repent? Feel bad for what he did? Obviously never. Babies can't repent. They're too little. They don't, they don't understand enough to repent. And no, the parents can't repent for them. That's what a lot of the, the, the Protestant churches do or the Catholic churches. The, the, they'll have the parents or the sponsor for the child and they speak for the child. We assure you he's repented. We promise. I can tell. I just... I can just see it in his eyes. Trust me, Father. He, he repented. I'm sure of it. That's not going to work. In order to be baptized, a person must also believe on Jesus Christ, that he is the Son of God. We already read that passage there in Acts chapter 8 with the Ethiopian eunuch. He said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. He said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And remember that little phrase there, with all thine heart. When you get baptized, and all every one of us, should believe on Jesus Christ with all our heart. Don't just make it a mental thing. Believe on Jesus Christ with all your heart. I just give you a few examples here. When Philip went to Samaria, P. 
people there believed the gospel that he preached, and they were baptized, both men and women. Let's look at that, Acts chapter 8 and verse 12. And you're going to see this over and over again in the Bible. Acts 8 and verse 12. But when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women, and toddlers and infants. Is that what it says? That's not what it says. Men and women, they believed. You don't read anything about babies being baptized in the Bible. There is no example of even one infant being baptized in the Bible. Not one. And I covered the household baptisms in that series on baptism. I went through every one of those too, and I showed that all of those households, it either specifically says they all believed, or it at least mentions nothing about infants. There are no babies baptized in the Bible, period, ever. And then the next verse in Acts 8, 13, Simon believes and he's baptized. Then Simon himself believed also, this is a sorcerer, and when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and wondered, beholding the miracles and signs which were done. In this case, here's a guy as a false convert. This is some false belief. He just wanted to get in so that he could get this gift of the Holy Ghost and he could do what the apostles were doing. But at least he professed a belief. And then we read in Acts 18 and verse 8 that many Corinthians heard the, go heard the gospel and were baptized. Acts 18 and verse 8. And Crispus, the chief ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his house, and many of the Corinthians, hearing, believed, and were baptized. You see the order there? That's really important. Hearing, believing, and being baptized. How, what order do the Catholics have it in? Get baptized, and then hear many, many years later, and then maybe believe after that. Maybe. They've got it totally backwards. Belief and baptism go hand in hand. We're told in Mark 16, 16, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. So this prevents infants or those too young to believe from being baptized. So anyone who is baptized as an infant needs to be rebaptized. And there are some people that get offended about that. I know people personally that they, I, I was baptized. When were you baptized? When I was a baby. Do you remember it? Well, no, but I know I was. Well, how do you know you were? You don't even know you were, actually. You just know people told you you were. You couldn't even prove to me you were. Do you got a picture of it? All you have is the testimony of your parents. Maybe they're lying. How do you even know? You couldn't even prove that you were baptized. It's ridiculous. And then you have to have a proper mode for a baptism to be legit. The proper mode of baptism is immersion in water. Now, I've already said this, that the English word bapti baptize is a transliteration of the Greek word baptizo. Both of these words mean to immerse, and I already read you that definition, so I'm not going to read it again. I will read you the, the definition of immerse, because baptize means to immerse in water. To immerse is to dip or plunge into a liquid, to put overhead in water, etc., specifically to baptize by immersion. So to immerse is to dip or plunge into a liquid, completely overhead, so you're totally underneath the surface of the water. That's what it means to immerse. Now, since the word baptize means to immerse, it stands to reason that the proper mode of immersion is immersion. You could, these words are interchangeable. You could say the proper mode of baptism is immersion. You could say the proper mode of immersion is immersion. To say the proper mode of baptism is immersion really is a redundancy. I mean, nobody would say the proper mode of immersion is immersion. Well, for me to even say the proper mode of baptism is immersion is really a redundancy. To immerse by sprinkling or pouring water on someone's forehead is asinine doublespeak. You can't immerse somebody by sprinkling with water. You can't baptize somebody by sprinkling them with water or pouring it on their forehead. And like I said, to baptize by sprinkling or pouring is a contradiction of terms. Now, as was before proved, baptism is a figure of salvation in Christ, 1 Peter 3.21. In baptism, we are symbolically buried with Christ. You remember that. Romans 6 and verse 4, buried with him in baptism. 
Immersion in water symbolized Christ's burial quite well because it was said in Matthew 12:40 that he was buried in the heart of the earth. He said, as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Jesus was completely surrounded with earth. He was immersed in earth. You say, well, he wasn't buried like with, with dirt put on top of his body, but he was in a cave, in a carved out cave of rock. And what is rock but hard dirt? And they put a stone on the front of the, the opening. So he was completely surrounded, immersed with dirt or rock. Christ's burial was not by sprinkling or pouring dirt on his forehead. Can you imagine if Joseph of Arimathea would have begged the body of Jesus from Pilate and said, I want to give him a proper burial, and then he laid him down there and sprinkled a little dirt on his forehead? Pilate would be like, uh, what are you doing? Well, I'm burying him. You know, burying, you can bury somebody by completely covering them with dirt or just putting a little dirt on their forehead. That's a burial, right? That's absurd. Baptism by sprinkling or pouring hardly symbolizes a burial, does it? By baptism, we are symbolically planted in the likeness of his death. We read that already in Romans 6, 5. To be planted means set in the ground as a plant, fixed in the ground, set up, established, etc. Placed surreptitiously or misleadingly, hidden, especially so as to deceive the discoverer. Like somebody is a plant. You know, they talk about somebody that's been infiltrated into an organization as a plant. He's deep within it. Nobody can see him because he's totally covered up. He's immersed in the organization. When you plant a seed in the ground, you put it and you cover it with dirt. To plant means to set or place in the ground so that it may take root and grow. That's why when you're baptized, you're buried, you're planted so you can take root and grow. Jesus described planting a corn of wheat as the wheat falling into the ground and dying. John 12, 24. I'm not going to read that. But you're probably familiar with that. To plant is to place something in the ground, not to sprinkle a, min a minute bit of dust on the seed, the equivalent of sprinkling water on someone's forehead to immerse them. So baptism by sprinkling or pouring hardly symbolizes planting. Can you imagine if somebody says, hey, I'm going to go plant my garden now, and they just lay these seeds out on the grass and just sprinkle a little dust on them. Somebody says, uh, what are you doing there? Oh, I'm planting the seeds. Planting, you know, sprinkling some dust. For some reason, I doubt that Protestants make very good uh, coroners, uh, funeral home directors, gardeners, farmers, I mean, you'd have a lot of stinky corpses laying around if Protestants were funeral directors. I, pl I buried the guy. See, he's laying there. See that little bit of dirt on his forehead? He's covered up. Trust me. The Bible clearly shows that baptism was done by immersion, which required much water and for people to be in the water. Let me show you this. John, six, uh, John 3 in verse 23. Now there was a time when a sermon like this would have been really important and, and Baptist preachers were probably preaching stuff like this all the time because baptism used to be a big deal. I mean, it used to be a major controversy. That's why Baptists were getting killed left and right for centuries. It was baptism, period. I mean, it was this deal. Believers being immersed in water. Many, many, many people died miserable deaths because of this right here. Immersing people and immersing believers in water. Now, people don't care about baptism today for the most part. People aren't preaching about it and arguing about it a whole lot. But this is a very important doctrine. John 3 and verse 23. It says, John also was baptizing in Enon near to Salem, because there was much water there, and they came and were baptized. Why was he baptizing in Eon? Enon. Because there was much water there. Apparently, you need a lot of water to baptize. Why would John be in a place where there was much water if all he needed was to sprinkle a few drops on people's heads? Think about it. You don't need much water to do that.
it's obvious much water was needed to immerse people. John baptized people in Jordan, not by Jordan. Look at Mark 1 and verse 5. Mark 1 and verse 5. And there went out unto him all the land of Judea and they of Jerusalem and were all baptized of him in the river of Jordan, confessing their sins. They were in the river when they were getting baptized. They weren't standing next to it. They weren't by the river. They were in it. And you'll see pictures of Jesus' baptism and baptisms as Protestants are uh, picturing them. I forget what the word I was trying to think of was there anyway. Portraying them. And Jesus and John are standing, you know, knee deep in Jordan and John's reaching down here and he's grabbing his cup and he's pouring water over Jesus' head. Why would you even bother to get your sandals wet? Why would you walk in into a river to dip down and get some water to pour on your head? That's ridiculous. Jesus, when he was baptized of John, went straight up out of the water. Mark 1 and verse 10. And straightway coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens open and the Spirit, like a dove, descending upon him. He didn't say he came up from by the water. He came up out of the water. He was down in the water. The Ethiopian eunuch asked what hindered him to be baptized when he came to a certain water. You remember that? Acts 8.36, we already read that. They came unto a certain water and he said, what doth hinder me to be baptized? It doesn't say that uh, the, the eunuch looked and noticed Philip's canteen and said, what doth hinder me to be baptized? I see you've got a bottle of water there, Philip. What's stopping me from being baptized? No, he sees a certain water, like a body of water, like a river or a pond or a lake. He sees a certain water. And that prompts him, oh, what hinders me to be baptized? Apparently, Philip must have preached baptism to him, which he did. And the eunuch knew enough, he knew a lot more than the Protestants do, that I need enough water to be immersed under the water. I don't just need some drops out of Philip's canteen. So to be baptized, both he and Philip, it says, went down into the water and they came up out of the water. Why would you get into the water just to sprinkle a couple of drops on somebody's head? That doesn't make any sense. So anyone who is not immersed in water needs to be rebaptized. Or I should say needs to be baptized. They were never baptized in the first place. Fourthly, for a baptism to be valid, it need, you need to have a proper belief. A confession in one's belief that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Acts 8, 36-38 again. I'm not going to read it. He said, What doth hinder me to be baptized? He said, If thou believest with all thine heart thou mayest. He said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. A confession that one is a sinner is also necessary to be baptized. We already read the verse which says that they were baptized in Jordan, confessing their sins. These two requirements prohibit infants and children who are too young to make these sincere confessions from being baptized. Can you imagine in a Methodist church or Presbyterian church and they bring the baby up and he says, Okay, son, if thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he says, Goo goo, ga ga. Sounds good to me. How absurd. He says, Dad, dad. He says, See, he's calling for God the Father. It deserves to be mocked. It's that ridiculous. Anyone who did not publicly confess that Jesus Christ is the Son of God needs to be rebaptized. Anyone who did not publicly confess that he is a sinner needs to be rebaptized. And then we have the proper result. This is the fifth criteria for a biblical proper baptism. The proper result of baptism is the addition of the baptized person to the membership of a true local church. We get this pattern from Acts chapter 2 and verse 41. You remember this was on the day of Pentecost when they heard the gospel and they were pricked in their hearts and Peter tells them to repent and be baptized. And then after that in verse 41 in Acts 2, 
in verse 41, it says, Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day were added unto them about 3,000 souls. So they were baptized, and the same day added unto them. The them there is the church in Jerusalem, that local church. And at that time, that church had 120 members, which for us is a mega church. For them was pretty small compared to what it was a few hours later. In first, or in Acts 1 and verse 15, it says, And in those days, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples and said, and in parentheses, the number of the names together were about 120. So in those days, when Peter stood up in the midst of the church, they had about 120 people whose names are together on a roll. 120 members of that church. That is the them that the people there in Acts chapter 2 were added unto when they were baptized. And these people there were, this was the church. They were assembled in one place with one accord. Acts chapter 2 and verse 1, it says, And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. So here's the church all together, all unified, one place, worshiping together. Peter's preaching the gospel. There's all these outsiders out there, thousands of Jews. They hear the gospel. They want to know what they do. He tells them to repent and be baptized. They were baptized and they were added unto them, to that 120. And that church then had over 3,000 members by the end of that day. It's obvious that they were added to the church because they continued from that time forward having church, which consisted of the apostles' doctrine, which is preaching, the apostles' fellowship, breaking of bread, which is communion, and prayers. We see that in the next verse, verse 42. Acts 2.42 And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. So they were added unto them, to the church, and they continued hearing the apostles preach, having communion, having prayer. Which is what church is by definition. And then if anybody still has any question, thinks, well, I don't know if they were really added to the church, look at verse 47. Praising God and having favor with all the people and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Just like he did on that day with the 3,000. They were added to the membership of the local church by their baptism. Now there's a curious thing that happens when a person is baptized. There's something that happens outwardly, which is obvious and plain. And then there's something that happens inwardly, which is not so obvious and plain. Outwardly, the pastor takes the convert. The convert makes a profession of faith. They walk out in the water together. The pastor lays the person under the water and brings them back up and presents them as a member of the church. Everybody sees that. But what you don't see is what's happening spiritually. Because at that same time, the Spirit of God is baptizing that person into the spiritual body of the church, the local church. This local church here in Excelsior Springs is a spiritual body made up of members. Just like a physical body has members. Paul talks about this in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. This is a spiritual body. We have members. And every time somebody's baptized, they're added as a member to the church. And it's necessary. God sets the members in the body as it hath pleased him. 1 Corinthians 12, 18. You know, if you're, if you're missing a foot or a leg, it's pretty hard to get by, isn't it? If you're missing a hand or an arm or an eye or an ear, it's hard to get by. That's why the church needs God to put members in it as it pleases him so that the church has all of the different gifts that the church needs. But in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, we see here that the Spirit of God is also doing some baptizing at the same time. It says, For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one Spirit. See, this is the Spirit doing the baptizing. This is not baptism with the Holy Ghost where Jesus, when Jesus filled the church with the Holy Ghost, this is baptism by the Holy Spirit. The Spirit is doing the baptizing. He is adding a person to the membership of the church. And it's a real thing. It's a spiritual thing, but it's a real thing. And I know that all of you that are members of this church have experienced it. Because I have been able to go to other churches. Now granted, I'm not even a member of that church. But I'm a member of the kingdom of God. And I have been able to go to other churches and meet people that I've never met before and feel a connection to them instantly that I would never feel with some other stranger that I met. And it's because we're both members of different bodies of Christ. But we're both members of 
local churches in God's kingdom. And the body that that person is added to is the membership of the local church. Verse 27, he says, Now ye are the body of Christ and members in particular. And he's talking to this local church, to the church in Corinth. Ye are the body of Christ, not part of the body. Ye are the body. Each local church is the body of Christ in and of itself. Because he talks about the members. One member suffers. All the members suffer with it. That can't be said of the general assembly and church of the firstborn which are written in heaven. The church of all God's elect. That can't be said of them. We wouldn't even know when most of them are suffering. They're, we don't even know who they are. This is talking about the local church. Now the question is, what is a true church? Because for baptism to be valid, it has to add you to the membership of a church, of a true church of Jesus Christ. What is a true church? Well, a true church is a baptistic church which has an unbroken lineage through baptistic churches to the church that Jesus Christ built. Look at Matthew 16 and verse 18. Matthew 16 and verse 18. The true church and the true ministry are interconnected to the point where they can't be separated because pastors are the ones that baptize and start churches. And it's in churches that pastors are ordained by other pastors. So those two things, you have to have a church to have a, to have a ministry and you have to have a ministry to have a church. You're not going to have one without the other. Jesus said in Matthew 16 and verse 18, But I say unto you, or I say unto thee, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock will I build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Jesus built his church in 30 A.D., 30, 33, around there, A.D., he said the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. It would never be destroyed, in other words. There would be a church of Jesus Christ on this earth throughout all time. He says that in Ephesians 3.21, that there be praise unto God through Jesus Christ world in the church, world without end. Amen. There would always be a local church of Jesus Christ on this earth. All through the Dark Ages, through the Inquisition, through all those horrible times when the Catholic Church was persecuting, there was always a true church, at least one, to continue to carry on the light, to continue to be a link in the chain, to continue to pass it down to the next generation. There's always been a true church on this earth. Examples of such churches are Baptists, Welsh Baptists, Anabaptists, Waldenses, Albigenses, Catharists, Paulicians, Donatists, Montanists, Novatians, Paterines. Arnoldists, uh, Henrichians, I could think of, there's a whole ton of them. They all went by different names, but they were all Baptistic churches that had a lineage back to the days of the apostles. All of these groups predated the Protestant Reformation with unbroken lineages. You can see that series on Baptist church history for proof of all that. And a true church is started by a validly ordained pastor baptizing a group of believers and forming them into a church, or it could be by a church being formed by already baptized members from another church. That's how this church was started. We were all, you were, we, we were all members of the Minneapolis church, and I formed eight of you at that time into the Excelsior Springs Church six years ago. You can see the sermon on how to start a non-501c3 church to see how that was done. So anyone that was not baptized in a true historic Baptist church and added to that church by his baptism needs to be rebaptized. Because if you weren't added to a church, it's not a proper baptism because we see the pattern there in Acts chapter 2 that all those that were baptized were added unto them, that is, to Christ's church. Now, let me just give you an example of rebaptism. I'm going to give you an example, I'm going to give you an analogy, and then we're going to be done. So, I think this hopefully should really clarify things. Sometimes analogies are great. I like to prove it with a scripture first, and then give you an analogy. I don't want to be one of these preachers that just preaches by analogy and proves everything by analogies. I gave you the scripture, now I'm going to give you some real world example, and then an analogy. So, take for example a man who is quote, baptized, unquote, in the Christian and Missionary Alliance Church like I was in 2004, the year before I was properly baptized. 
I use myself as an example. That way nobody can say I'm picking on them. The problem with my previous baptisms, and I say baptisms because I was also baptized in a Lutheran church in 2003, is that they were performed in churches which were not true churches by pastors who were not biblically ordained. The Lutheran one is obvious. The Christian Missionary Alliance one I will prove to you here in a second. So the CMA Church, Christian Missionary Alliance, the CMA Church is a Protestant church that was started by a pastor from the Presbyterian Church, which was started in the Protestant Reformations by Catholics. So you got Catholic Church, Presbyterian Church, Christian Missionary Alliance Church. That's the order of the lineage. The problem with that is that a clean thing cannot come out of an unclean. Job 14 and verse 4. Job 14 and verse 4. It may be an organization. It may be a group of people that get together and hear a Bible. In some cases, maybe a real Bible. In a lot of cases, probably not. It may be a group of people that get together and hear some Bible teaching, but it's not a church. Job 14 and verse 4. Who can bring a clean thing out of an unclean? Not one. Not Martin Luther. Not John Calvin. Not John Knox. Nobody. Nobody can bring a clean thing out of an unclean. If Martin Luther wanted to bring a clean thing out of an unclean, you know what he should have done? He should have repented and got baptized by a Baptist. And then had that Baptist preacher ordain him if that Baptist preacher thought that he was called to preach. And then Martin Luther could have gone out and started a true church if he could have found enough people to preach to and baptize. If that's what Martin Luther wanted to do, that's, that's the church that he should have started. He should have repented and became a Christian instead of trying to reform the Catholic Church. The Roman Catholic Church, we're told, is the mother of harlots, which means that she has many harlot daughters. Revelation 17 and verse 5. Revelation 17 and verse 5. It says, And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. There's good evidence that, that this woman in Revelation 17 is referring to the Catholic Church. She sits on many waters, which means that she's, you know, many waters or many lands, so she's spread all over the earth. She's drunk with the wine of her fornication. She is full of names of blasphemy. First of all, she commits fornication with the kings of the earth. She's been in bed with governments for centuries. She's full of names of blasphemy, like Mary, Mother of God, like calling the Pope Holy Father, things like that. In verse 3, she's arrayed with purple and scarlet cover, color and decked with gold and precious stones. Verse 4, her, her cathedrals are ornately adorned. She's drunk with the blood of the saints in verse 6. She murdered millions and millions of Christians. She's a, she's a woman that sits on seven hills and Rome is known as the city on seven hills. And you see that there in, um, in verse 9. So anyway, the point is, this is the Roman Catholic Church in Revelation 17. And it says she's the mother of harlots, which means that she has harlot daughters. Does she not? Isn't the Roman Catholic Church called the what? The mother church? She is the mother church, the mother of harlots. She's got daughters that have spawned from her. There's an old proverb in, in Ezekiel 16.44, which says, As is the mother, so is her daughter. Her daughters are the same as she is. They just have tweaks. Things are a little bit different. Their baptism is still the same. They still persecute or did persecute the saints like she did. They do a lot of things the same. They have church hierarchies and things like that. They're, they're set up in, in a similar way. They're just, you know, they're, they're a bit different. See, her daughters are the Protestant churches, which were started by the reformers who were disgruntled Catholics. Those reformers like Luther, Calvin, Zwingli, Knox, etc., did not leave the Catholic Church and repent and be baptized by a Baptist pastor in a true church. They rather tried to reform the Catholic Church by starting their own churches. And it wasn't as if Martin Luther didn't know about the Baptists. He teamed up with them for a while and then persecuted after he got his own church going. The Protestant churches are reformed Catholic churches which retains some of her fundamental characteristics, one of which is her infant baptism by pouring and sprinkling. 
all those Protestant churches that came from her, they kept that Catholic baptism, which is one of the, the key things that makes the Catholic Church no church at all. Just one of the things. Like I said, they also persecuted the Baptists, both in Europe and in America. Most people don't know that that Baptists were persecuted in America in the colonial period. Bitter, cruel persecutions. People that were whipped. Whipped to the point where the blood ran down and filled their boots. I read you about, read you accounts of that in the Baptist church history study. That was done by Protestants, Church of England people in this country. The problem is that the nature of a corrupt thing cannot be changed by changing the name and modifying some of the beliefs and practices. Jeremiah 13, 23, Jeremiah said, um, can, it, can the Ethiopian change his spots? Can the Ethiopian change I'm getting tired. Let's go back to Jeremiah 13, 23. The Ethiopian can't change his spots either, but the leopard, leopard is the real one that can't change his spots. Jeremiah 13, 23. You know what verse I'm talking about. Jeremiah eleven twenty three. Can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard his spots? Then may ye also do good that are accustomed to do evil. He can't change. The Ethiopian can't change his skin color. The leopard can't change his spots. He can't make himself a zebra. Neither can a church that came out of the Catholic Church make themselves into one of God's churches. You got to start over. You just can't try to reform some corrupt thing. You just got to break off completely and start over. And you can't just start it yourself. You got to go find somebody that has it and get it from them. That's what Luther should have done. Now, let's get back to my story here. The founder of the CMA church was a man named A.B. Simpson. He was ordained in the Presbyterian church. I've got a link there to Wikipedia that you can read about it if you're interested. Not that you probably would be. The Presbyterian Church is not a true church because it came from the Roman Catholic Church, which is evident because they baptize babies by pouring and sprinkling. Excuse me. Now, a church that baptizes babies, in other words, unbelievers, is not a true church. The Catholic Church is not a true church. Therefore, the Presbyterian Church is not a true church. Therefore, A.B. Simpson's ordination was not biblically valid. Therefore, the Christian and Missionary Alliance church that he started was not a true church. Therefore, the ministers in those churches are not biblically ordained ministers and have no authority to baptize. Therefore, baptisms that are performed in those churches are not true baptisms, even if they were done by immersion, and do not add people to true churches. Therefore, my baptism in the CNMA church and the Lutheran church were not true baptisms. Now, when I learned the truth, I was rebaptized, or to be more accurate, I was properly baptized by Pastor Tim Boffy of the Cincinnati Church, which is a true church of Jesus Christ, with a true lineage, going back to the apostles. If a believer who was baptized in a Catholic or Protestant church wants to follow Jesus Christ in truth and be a member of one of his true churches, then he needs to do what I did and get baptized. For me to try to reform the CMA church, which I did for a little while and try to get people convinced, you know, to do the right thing and all that. For me to try to reform that church would have been a waste of time because even if I could have convinced them to believe in the doctrine of election, the King James Bible, a millennial eschatology, proper baptism, you name it. If I could have convinced them to believe in everything that is true, it wouldn't have mattered. It's not a true church. We would have had to have found a Baptist pastor, had him come in and form that group of people into a true church, and then trained and ordained the pastor of that church if he was even ordainable, and then it would have been a true church. But just to try to reform it and make it into one, you can't do that. You've got to start over. You've got to get the ordination from somebody that already has it. You can't just make it up on your own. All right, now let me give you an analogy. And I'm glad that I'm almost to the end because my voice is about dead. I think this will this should help. I think this should help to really clear it up. Somebody might wonder if being rebaptized is like renewing your driver's license. I had somebody ask me that one time. And I thought that that was a great example that I could use as an analogy. Renewing your driver's license is not 
like being baptized. Because once baptism has been properly done, it never needs to be redone. So when you get, you know, your ba your driver's license, you got to get it renewed every four or six years or whatever it is. Baptism, once you've done it and done it right, you never get baptized again. You go and transfer to another church, you don't need to get rebaptized. And by the way, if somebody came to us from the Southern Baptists and, and they held to a position of Baptist church perpetuity, that they had a lineage through the true Baptist, I wouldn't rebaptize them unless there was something else wrong with their baptism. You know, if, if there might have been some other problem, but as far as the church and the pastor that it was done by, that would be a, a that's a that's a legitimate church, even though their doctrine's messed up. You know, you look in the Book of Revelation, you got seven churches, five out of the seven have messed up doctrine in the first century. So just because a church has some doctrine that's wrong doesn't mean it's not a true church. So I make a distinction between true churches with error and churches that came from the Catholic Church that aren't churches at all. There's a big difference there. A driver's license, though, is a good analogy. Let's say when a man initially got his driver's license, he's 16 years old, he went to a place which claimed to be